Okay. Great. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, anyway, it's really great to to, to be here again. And um, and I as uh, as Ben just mentioned, I I really do. Um, I've kind of planned for this talk to be a little bit more forward thinking. Um, uh, it'll talk about some stuff that has been published, but I'll say most of it is is still unpublished. And this is stuff that we're we're definitely thinking about. Um, so one of the things that I mentioned a lot um, uh, uh, the other day was that that uh, data independent acquisition is largely about balance and sacrifice. And so uh, you ha we have these 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 kind of competing interests, right? We we want to be able to sample. Um, uh, different samples comprehensively. Um, we want a minimum of you know 500 to 900 mass to charge. Ideally, um, at least you know 400 to 1200 mass to charge if possible. Um, we would like to have a single method that has narrow precursor windows. Um, ideally, less than four mass to charge. Um, uh, the reason for the four mass to charge uh, uh, comes down to um, the elemental composition CH2. Um, so that's mass uh, 14. Uh, and if you're thinking about four mass to charge, we're thinking about um, you know, doubly charged uh, is, uh, is eight. Um, Dalton's and triply charged would be 12. So we definitely want a window size that's, uh, that's smaller than what would allow um, CH2 differences to fall in a window because oxidations are 16. Um, any other modification has a bigger mass than that. And uh, CH2 is a very common um, uh, uh, a mass difference that occurs in biology. So uh, we want to be able to cover the breadth uh, of a range, uh, this, whatever this mass range is, uh, in say, uh, um, uh, in either 500, 900, or 400 to 1,200 in less than or approximately two-second cycle time. And this comes down to the fact that do we have enough points across the peak to be able to define an area? For Orby traps, um, we want to be able to fill the ion trap in most scans. Um, that means that we have the, the greatest sensitivity or the best chance for, for sensitivity. Uh, I'll also point out that one of the challenges with Orby traps is that Orby traps are, are thought of as being sensitive mass spectrometers, but they're actually insanely insensitive mass spectrometers. They're only sensitive because we put a lot of ions in them. And so if you're putting a million ions in them and it takes 55 milliseconds or 60 milliseconds to do that, that actually is a very insensitive measurement. Um, so image current detection tends to be a lot less sensitive than using electron multipliers. So the other, the other major problem that we have is that um, I already mentioned is why we want the smaller windows is because um, it's basically... As smaller the windows, the uh, we're basically getting um, uh, better detections and better sensitivity. So we started thinking about this going back to around about 2004 and 2005. I had a, um, a graduate student named Mike Hoopman who started uh, to work on this, and uh, and one way to describe the way we've been thinking about it is is these sort of these riddles that you kind of get, and someone will say, "Okay, you've got ten buckets." One of those buckets has twice as much water as the other. How would you determine in as, mi in as small number of measurements as possible which one has twice as much water? So currently these are all unknown. And the way that we currently do this is we measure each bucket at a time. And so basically if you think about this as being each one is a mass window or an isolation width, this is the way kind of we approach proteomics. And I'll point out... Um, and we, we can get to figure out that this bucket has twice as much water, um, but it takes 10 measurements. And I'll point out right now, too, that, that mass spectrometry is the only field that we do this in. So when you're talking about image analysis or when we talk about like MRIs or everything else, most, most fields try to figure out ways in which you can measure multiple things simultaneously and then demultiplex it in a solution. So uh, let's just think about this in a very simplistic way. So what if we just took it and said, look, we're going to measure these five buckets together. And we can say, okay, well, this is five times the, the, the one pound weight. And that took one measurement. So we know that it's not present in that one. We measure this one and we know, okay, it's got to be in that three. And then we measure the last, um, you know, uh, uh, then we start to measure them individually. And we can now get this in about three measurements. So... We started to think about this a while back, about whether or not we could do the same thing with data independent acquisition. And that is, if we think about these things as being a given individual fragment ion intensity, so one fragment ion 
and what's the intensity of it. And if let's say we're now measuring these um, subset of the windows simultaneously, um, we get some measurement of A, B, D, and J that has some sort of linear combination of their mass or their intensity. And then we have measured another combination of those individual windows, and we get the co combined intensity of both um, this B and the um, uh, I, because they're the only ones that have signal in it. And then, of course, we can repeat this, and eventually you get some sort of linear equations that you can eventually solve using either a lasso-type regression or a non-negative uh, least squares. And in our hands, we've actually been, had some pretty good success with non-negative least squares in doing this. So you probably are asking, well, why um, are we thinking about this now, and why didn't we do this beforehand? And and we, I'll I'll tell you a little bit about we are we are doing this um, uh, a slightly different way more recently. But one of the reasons why we struggled with this is we didn't know how initially to collect these multiple different isolation windows. We tried to do it on linear ion traps using multiple waveforms, but it ended up being um, uh, not not particularly uh, efficient. So. A lot of this changed when we saw um, uh, some initial uh, information about what um, about what the Q exactive would look like. Um, when we saw this hardware design, we realized, okay, well, we've got an Orbi trap in here. We have a quadrupole mass filter. We have an HCD cell, and we could, and we have a C trap, so we could, in theory, select a mass, fragment it, and store the fragments. We could then fill again, fragment it, and store the mass of that fragment. And then we can measure a single spectrum that contained multiple quad isolations. So when you normally think about doing MSMS on, a, on an Orbi trap, you have this time in which you're doing an Orbi tra trap FTMS acquisition. And then a portion of that time is going on in parallel where you're filling the C trap, and then you're moving those ions over to the Orbi trap, and you're, and you're then um, doing it again. So then you, during that time, you're filling for the next scan. What we wanted to do was basically uh, multiplex this so we could have five different windows in parallel. So let me just kind of uh, summarize this a little bit. Um, we published this in 2013. Um, and the idea initially was, okay, we wanted to go from 500 to 900. We wanted to have that magic four mass to charge wide windows, like I already mentioned. So this meant that basically we need to do 100 MSMS measurements on a chromatographic time scale, which wasn't possible um, uh, at the time uh, individually. But if you multiplex this by five, it's possible. So what we did is we randomly select five windows. Um, we then, in the second scan, randomly select five of the remaining 95. Um, in the third, you randomly select five of the remaining 90. And then totally you get to scan 20. Um, and, uh, and now you have only five remaining. And then scan 21, you refill the list and randomly select them again. So if you look here, in between scan 20 and 21, there's one set of windows that are shared. So if you have fragment ions that are in 20 and 21, they probably are belonging to the same isolation window as the other ones are completely different. So it's kind of like measuring, again, those series of buckets. Um, again, and, and what we're trying to do is for any one fragment ion to try to derive what, which windows it actually came from and what contribution it came from. So you have, again, let's say you have this uh, isolation window 1, 7, 28, 81, and 84. Um, each fragment ion can be kind of some linear combination of the, uh, uh, from an individual precursor window. So if we are looking at scan number 100, um, any one fragment ion can be the sum of those individual uh, isolation windows. And you can't solve that uh, by itself, but if you go a certain number of scans in before and a certain number of scans after, you eventually get to the point where you have 100 uh, knowns and 100 unknowns, and this becomes just some basic linear algebra. And so it's, uh, we've been solving this, as I said, on non-negatively squares, but we've also tried um, some lasso uh, analyses, and it, and it tends to work pretty well. So let me just show you a little bit of what this looks like. So uh, in, the, um, in the upper left-hand corner is looking at the data from these five four-master charge white isolation windows. Um, this is the target peak that we're extracting the chromatograms from. It's at this point around about 51.5 um, minutes. 
And you notice there's a lot of different signals there. It would be hard to actually pick out this peak just by eye. Um, but if you look at it, it's actually fairly clean underneath. Uh, there are transitions that are definitely unaltered and don't have um, interferences with them. But when you go about demultiplexing the data, you see that we basically get this really clean peak. So this is basically 20 mass of charge of data measured in each individual scan. Um, we're, of course, multiplexing and randomizing the, the five four mass to charge wide windows in any one scan. And then in this case is where we're applying this non-negative least squares to demultiplex the data down to this uh, a much cleaner chromatogram. Okay, I'm going to show a couple other comparisons here. So here is um, looking at this target peptide um, in a complex matrix. Here's doing 10 mass to charge DIA. Um, here's doing this multiplex method, this five by four windows. And uh, so this actually has twice as much um, uh, mass range uh, measured in any one spectrum, but it's broken up into five four mass of charge wide windows. And this has um, got half the amount uh, measured in any one scan. But if you notice, because it's not multiplexing them and not able to demultiplex the data, the chromatographic space is a much noisier than you would actually get from this demultiplex file. If you blow up the window, you can see why still doing wide isolation windows still gives you a nice chromatographic peak. Um, um, but this data definitely looks much cleaner than this data. So this definitely is something that we're, we're very excited about and something that uh, was very promising when we started doing this. We started doing this around about 2011. We got a paper was published in 2013. And here's just another example. But it's the same basic idea. And no matter... How many examples you look at it, it's always kind of exciting to see that, that the demultiplex data looks way cleaner um, than, the, than the multiplex data. Now, there is some problems with this, and that is that if, you have, if you're measuring five four mass to charge wide windows, or let's make the math a little bit simpler, so it's four or five mass to charge wide windows, and let's say you had 60 milliseconds as a maximum inject time, in order to keep the mass, mass analyzer going at a given rate, that basically means that you can't fill any one of the masses for more than about 15 milliseconds. So um, uh, that, um, uh, that means in many cases, at least with the, uh, the QEHF or the QE Plus or the QE Classic, we basically meant that almost every single scan was underfilled. Um, so yes, we gained this really improved selectivity to basically running four mass of charge worth of data um, but we definitely lost some sensitivity. Now, I'll point out that with the, since the release of the uh, Fusion Lumos, um, with much better ion optics and a segmented uh, quadruple, of course, the QEHF also has a segmented quad, but it does not have the same uh, ion optics as the Fusion Lumos. We now have, in almost all the cases where majority of the peptides are coming out, um, we are actually filling the Orbi trap. And we haven't done this experiment yet, but I'm assuming the QEHFX, the brand new release Q Exactive instrument from Thermo, uh, will also have the same characteristics since it's using very similar front end ion optics to the Fusion Lumos. I'm just going to show this another way. Um, instead of having it as being the, the what fraction of the scans hit the, uh, had their uh, a, a given target. Um, uh, I'm looking at at what what at how what was the length of the fill time used in each mixed scan, and in the QEHF, 100% of the scans were at the maximum inject time, so 60 milliseconds. One confusing thing between the Fusion series and the QE series is that they use completely different nomenclature for everything. So uh, the QEHF uses the combination of the five windows, um, or the and in the case or the four windows in this case. Um, and in this and uh, in the Fusion Lumos, they looked at what individual, what is the fill time for each individual window. Uh, this data chromatographically uh, came out in a much smaller window than it probably should have been. But uh, where where the peptides are alluding from, we're seeing basically um, uh, fill times are less than the maximum inject time in in most cases. So this is very promising. So so we now believe that we have an in, a method um, on the Fusion Lumos, or the QEHFX, that you can actually fill the orbit trap so you have high sensitivity and you can have high selectivity by basically having uh, five or four mass of charge of selectivity by demultiplexing. Now, um, in the period of time before the Lumos came out, um, we were still struggling with the fact that we didn't have um, uh, enough sensitivity. 
So we began to think about, are there other ways around this? And so one of the things that we came up with um, was uh, this experiment. So this idea that if you, if you had 20 MZ wide isolation windows and you have two different uh, co-looting peaks um, in a given isolation window, uh, I've putted, well, one of them here is shown in solid, um, in a solid uh, chromatographic peak, and the interfering peak that we're not interested in is shown in a dashed line. However, if you offset your window in alternating scan cycles, uh, the peak that's in the correct half of the isolation window will have a uh, sort of a solid um, trace, when the peak that's in the other half of the window will have this sort of um, jagged um, uh, 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 peak profile. And I'll point out that this sampling approach is very similar to how people do um, uh, super resolution microscopy. So one of the issues in microscopy has been for a very long time, has been how do you obtain uh, the ability to image things within a cell at smaller sizes and the wavelength of light, right? And so currently that, that so, in, so previously that wasn't possible, but then super resolution microscopy came about, and what they did is they moved basically the, where they were imaging at smaller intervals than than the wavelength of light that they were able to basically then reconstruct what what the object was, even though the object was smaller than the wavelength of light. And this is basically what we're doing here: is we have a window that's twice the size uh, of. Um, of what we can act by, we have this window of 20 mass of charge, but by offsetting it by 10 mass of charge, we can ultimately gain back the resolution of 10 mass of charge. So let me just show you um, an example of this. So here is this target peptide, um, and it's extracted. I think this is a, a, a yeast peptide. And you'll see that these are different chromatographic B and Y ions that are extracted from the data. And you'll notice that. You know, there's lots of different peaks at different times um, uh, and which peak belongs to the target peptide of interest. If you stagger um, the isolation windows, you'll notice that some of these peaks become, uh, you know, this sawtooth pattern and some become our state remains smooth. And this basically is, is where those peaks are on the other half of the isolation window. If you apply that same non-negatively squares linear algebra, those peaks then disappear. Um, so, and if you actually collect the data with 10 master charge of data, it looks really clean and nice. So again, let me just, um, go back here. So here's basically the, the data with overlapping windows. Here's applying this computational demultiplexing. Here's it with 10 mass charge DIA. So you can't get any better than 10 mass charge DIA, DIA. And you'll notice that there's almost no difference in the way that the data looks between the 10 mass charge and the 20 mass charge overlapping with the multiplexing. Um, one of the things that enabled this to be particularly powerful was to you uh, um, was uh, Thermo had come up with a segmented quadrupole, which meant that basically the isolation window was very uniform and um, and and flat topped. So it meant that signal on one side of the uh, the isolation window and the other were fa um, basically gave very similar response, whether or not the window was shifted over by ten master charge or not. And I showed this figure. Um, uh, uh, two days ago, where basically I said, you know, MSMS basically gives better lower limit of quant in almost every case, unless if you have a really wide isolation window. But basically, the 20 mass of charge overlapping has almost indistinguishable limit of quantitation relative to a window half of its size. Um, now, there was a problem, um, and that is that we had a strategy that was in Skyline. Um, uh, it still is in Skyline um, that basically went and uh, demultiplexed each individual transition by itself. So the more transitions that people started to import, it started to have this this uh, huge increase in processing time to demultiplex it. So a lot of people got frustrated with this by if you're looking for a large DIA experiment and you had, say, 50,000 transitions, um, it would start to take a very long time to import and demultiplex it. So with a lot of, of work from uh, Jared Egertson, um, Austin Keller, a, another graduate student in the lab, and then uh, also people like uh, Nick uh, Shulman and, and uh, Matt Chambers at, at Vanderbilt, uh, they were able to get um, an algorithm that basically could demultiplex the entire spectrum in one pass. Uh, and, uh, and it took a constant amount of time, regardless, of course, the number of transitions that are being imported in the skyline. Uh, this is currently uh, implemented only in uh, in MS Convert, but it is actually being uh, worked into the uh, 
uh, the, the software tools that Skyline uses directly. There is an option up here for the filters, so you can demultiplex overlapping windows or you can demultiplex MSX windows and spit them out. So I would definitely encourage people to try this. Um, uh, we've, in our hands, we've never seen a case uh, where it has not been useful to do overlapping windows compared to using windows that are, that are um, twice its size. Um, we have not tried this with um, uh, with other vendors much. We've done, we've done it a little bit with, um, uh, I think, with Bruker data, but not much with, with other platforms. So I definitely encourage people to, to try this and uh, give us some feedback. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, the new software tools that our lab's been, been working on. Um, these are all Mike, the things I Mike, think... Can I, can I pause yeah. you for a second? Okay. Can you say something about how, how that relates to variable windows since they've been, they've been using a 64 variable yeah. window... Uh, isolation scheme can you use it on that. Does it, you know, does it, how does it compare? What's what, do you, what can you say? We've never done any variable window stuff in our lab. Um, we've done only kind of these constant wide window data or narrow window data. Uh, we found that overlapping the windows is better than just using a constant wide window data. Uh, it doesn't mean that we we it it couldn't be done with variable windows. It's just it makes the um, overlapping windows a little bit more complicated. Um, well. While we're doing questions, maybe I can ask about the MS convert. So uh -huh, sure. this just gives you out a file which uh, which has an M, like an MZML file that that has basic. If you if you started with twenty, now you get essentially simulated ten MZ right. windows. So it looks That's like right. a regular. That's right. So 10 you can run it into window. any software that. That's correct. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, so basically you can output any of the file formats that the Purdue Wizard supports. Um, and if your windows are overlapping, it will automatically demultiplex those MSMS windows to the, to the narrow window size. And I'll just add, so yeah, you then end up with a file that looks like, it, I mean, you, could, you can run comment on it. You, you, it looks like it has no, mm -hmm. no multiplexing at all, and you, sh and you definitely should avoid then bringing that into Skyline with demultiplexing. Cause so there's, so there's still, there's still the old settings as we're going to just rip these out, but, or, or we're going to actually change them to use this code. But, uh, at this point, if you were to say, Oh, demultiplex my data, you don't have a multiplex data file anymore. So. Yeah. And, and we've had some discussions, uh, about whether or not this could be done on the fly on some instruments. So you basically just then write a demultiplex file, um, that's that's currently not possible, but but that's something that we've been thinking about if that's if that would be possible and what would it would take to do it. Okay, so a little bit about some new tools. Um, so I'll, I'll talk um, currently about some two tools that are kind of going on in our lab. So we we got started thinking about this, and we you know we wanted a a query engine for DIA data. Um, and one of the things that we kind of expected or wanted um, uh, was to be able to uh, get better peptide detections than DDA. Now, I've already mentioned quite a bit that our kind of lab really does feel like, like having a more constrained search space in many ways allows us to kind of manually interrogate the data better. We're able to follow up on the results. We can make sense better of it than, than we could otherwise. But that being said, reviewers don't always agree with that. And so often um, we still had to uh, provide evidence that we, we, we did have the capability to get um, as good or better detections in DDA. Uh, we also needed um, the ability to ensure that there's no missing data across many runs. And of course, people get frustrated when it takes a long time to process their data. So we wanted, in theory, to have as short processing times as possible. So I'll talk a little bit about, um, about this, one of the tools that we've developed first. So this was kind of the, the idea that I had pitched to Sonia Ting, who was a graduate student in the lab. I said, look, um, what I want is basically like the equivalent of going to, um, to Google Maps. You could type in your favorite peptide sequence or location, and you'd get, you know, if let's say you are in dire need of a cup of coffee, you know, you can find, you know, where all the local Starbucks here in your, in your favorite city. And you get basically different, you know, um, information, and the lookup goes really quickly. So could we do something kind of the equivalent for DIA data where all you give it is a peptide sequence and you give it then um, in your data um, what is the best evidence for that and you get information and scores that use different pieces of information like you know your precursor information your phagmanine information if you have multiple different runs it would in theory give you some different quantitative information now of course we're not talking about stars here we're talking about real quantitative scores or statistical scores 
So this was the basic idea um, that, uh, so did we really need um, a spectrum library? Did we need um, a retention, known retention time for it? And I'll point out that this is basically the worst case scenario, right? This is, we're taking the least amount of information and trying to find evidence for a given peptide. When of course, in many cases, we know a lot about the peptide. We know what the relative fragment ion intensities are. We have other runs where we've measured the retention time. So this is basically a case where it's basically the, um, the worst case scenario. So, um, uh, so I'll just point that out to begin with. So you have this basic peptides of infra interest. We have uh, some DIA um, data, and this is all before we figured out how to demultiplex the entire spectrum. So, uh, but we generally take centroided results. So we want some peak picked um, DIA data. Uh, we also require a protein sequence database on top of these peptides of interest. And this is mostly to give us some uh, background information about what sort of the interference landscape should be like in, in, a, given, um, in a given sample type. And then, of course, we do a bunch of uh, peptide processing data extraction, background estimation. I'll talk about some of these things in a second. And then ultimately, of course, we want to be able to import these results and, and look at them in Skyline. And one of the challenges here is, again, these data are just very noisy. And so how do you go about picking using this sort of information? This MS1 data basically has total interference in, um, in it. And here is the MS2 data. But this is the best location and time for this, this individual peptide sequence. So let's go and look at the, the, uh, the first one. So we're analyzing each isolation window um, at a time. Um, in this case, it's a 10 uh, MZ isolation window. Uh, we have our target peptides of interest and the corresponding decoy peptides. One of the things that we... Um, uh, we do is we calculate um, kind of a score matrix. And, and that is that we, we weight each... Uh, fragment ion mass that we're, we're looking for for a given peptide sequence by, the, uh, by basically the inverse of the frequency at which of the occurrence within a protein sequence database. So for instance, if you look at like a Y ion fragment ion, you're either going to have, and for trypsin, you're either going to have a lysine or arginine. So ha you know, more than half the spectra are going to have one or the, one or the other. And so these are going to be ones that are not going to have a very strong weight in a given peptide sequence for a given Y ion series. So, so for instance, if you have a given target peptide, this is basically our score matrix. And so basically, um, well, those are, are, that are bigger peaks are rare ions, given the sequence database you've given it. And then, of course, we do the same thing for decoys. And we do the same uh, decoy generation strategy that Ludovic uh, mentioned. We keep the lysine or arginine constant, and we rotate the... the um, the uh, reverse the the other portion of the sequence. Uh, we calculate this this uh, this core matrix across all XICs, um, and so we extract all the XICs. We calculate uh, um, uh, and then we calculate, of course, a given score, and we do it again, of course, for the decoy sequence. One of the things that we noticed uh, early on was that there's some portions in the retention time that score high regardless of what the peptide sequence is. So it just happens to have a high background. There's lots of things in the spectrum. And so it doesn't matter what the sequence is. It's going to, every peptide sequence is sometimes going to score incorrectly at that given retention time. So we wanted to come up with a way to estimate the background score. And so we, this is where the protein sequence database comes in. We calculate all that, and we calculate now, I think we've settled on about 2,000 randomly shuffled peptides. So this is basically another type of decoy, but it's shuffling the peptides and not actually reversing them. And then we use that to calculate essentially um, a background score at every point in time. And so we do this for each individual charge state. Um, and as you can see, there's definitely some regions in time that just seem to score high regardless even of the charge state. So then what we do is we take our target score uh, distribution, we take our background, and we calculate then our background subtracted score. Um, the final thing that we do is we then take the, the top uh, set of peaks, and we, have, we apply a, a fairly simple heuristic ultimately in the end, and that is we say, look, you know, we're, we're just going to throw out some of the picked peaks if the score contribution is, isn't from a certain number of uh, fragment ions. So if most of your, of your score contribution comes from only two peaks, um, it's less likely to be a real observation than one that comes from many different peaks. So in this case here, we just um, would throw out those, those other ones except for this, this peak. And then for that one, we then calculate multiple different scores. Um, 
And, uh, and we do this for every single isolation window, for every single peptide of interest, and we feed this into a machine learning algorithm that we uh, uh, developed with Lucas Schall and, and Bill Noble uh, back in 2007. And uh, we use this to calculate p-values and q-values, ultimately, and, and posterior error probabilities as well. Okay, so I'll give a couple applications and a couple kind of sanity checks for you. I'll, I'll point out that we haven't looked at every possible thing that, that could potentially occur, but we've looked at a lot of things now, and, and in general, we're fairly happy with it. So one thing I'll tell you is that in general, we still like to have fairly restricted um, search space in, in, our, in our example. So we have had a lot of projects in the lab where we've been looking at mitochondrial proteomics. And so we had, in a case where we had a mouse heart proteome, and there's about 1,200 uh, mouse mitochondrial proteins from the MITOP P2 database. So this gives about 62,000 peptide precursors. And this is substantially less than looking for like the 14 million peptides that are in the entire uh, proteome. And so if you do a database, uh, regular DDA run and comment, from just unfractionated heart um, using a wide isolation uh, pre MS1 window um, and using Comet with percolator, uh, we get about um, 220. If we do DIA using a narrow window, so this is 400 to 900, um, and we do five mass charge wide isolation windows, and we use pecan with with um, uh, with percolator on the back end, uh, we end up getting then 326 mitochondrial proteins. So in general, we're we're basically encompassing um, most of what you'd get by um, by DDA and a and a comet search, um, and we get, you know, a little bit more. And, and this is actually not too bad. I mean, this is, you know, we're doing, you know, we're looking for mitochondrial proteins in, in the context of an unfractionated uh, heart tissue. I'll point out, of course, uh, uh, in the heart, about 30% of the proteins are mitochondrial proteins. Or, so it's, it's actually not that surprising that we're actually getting uh, this, this sort of um, many results. So I, I want to point out, we decided initially, very similar to like what Brendan pointed out um, yesterday is the first thing that you, we wanted to do was to kind of look at these things ourselves manually of did some of these things make sense, this 106 proteins that we're getting that are unique to one that were not present in the other one. Because in general, we basically trust the results of this DDA and Comet. People have used this for a very long time. We know how percolator works with it. We've used this a lot in our lab. A lot of other people have used it too with other tools. So we felt fairly confident about that. So in the end, we, we felt like we needed to kind of evaluate, though, whether or not these things were, were absolute real observation or not. The first thing we did was pick the protein that had the most number of peptides that we found no DDA results for at all. And these are all the chromatograms for it. And I'll point out right off the bat, these are messy, and they're meant to be messy because DIA data is really messy in general. And so if you look here, there's actually six separate peptides that, that uh, Pecan uh, showed for this. Um, and there is, a, and, and in each case, I have um, the, the MS1 chromatograms, and I have the MS2 chromatograms. And you'll see these are not being cherry-picked for, we have no library, so we're not picking the top three or top four things. We're using every B and Y ion. If you look down here, you'll notice there's actually about seven or eight really good co co-varying chromatograms. Down here, there's about 10. Down here, there's several as well. Down here, there's lots of different covariant chromatograms. But in most cases, there's no MS1 signal. Uh, and so this was something that was pretty um, eye-opening to us um, and something that we felt was actually um, uh, an advantage of using DIA because we're using five massive charge isolation windows. Um, so the likelihood that we're missing that MS1 that MS1 is, is not too likely, that we're not too far off of the precursor window. We're not looking at completely modified things. Um, and, and, that, uh, and that also meant that we're enriching. So we're now putting our million ions in the orbit trap from a five mass charge wide window as opposed to basically a 375 to, um, to 1400 mass to charge wide range. So, mm -hmm. This was just um, five master charge with it. It was not in multiplexed. Uh, and so this was still, um, uh, this was actually before we had the ability to demultiplex the entire spectrum. So at that point, we were only able to demultiplex things in Skyline until the last um, uh, year or so. So, uh, so then we went and... Um, and did another experiment, and that was, and this was something that Brendan really encouraged Sonia to look at, 
And he said, uh, you know, so let's just take another data set and, uh, and see how we do with DDA and DIA. And, and we have this kind of unique resource in, in our lab that we've, um, we've used a lot. And this is from uh, uh, Josh Labar's lab. Uh, he has a cDNA library for about eight or 9,000 um, proteins. So we basically have the ability to make recombinantly most proteins um, in the lab. And so what we decided to do is let's just search those 8,000 proteins or so with uh, from and these were human proteins, so we went to a HeLa cell lysate, and we uh, in in the case of Comet and DDA, there was about six thousand um, proteins that we were able to find. Um, well, these are peptides, and in uh, and in uh, pecan with DIA, we were able to find you know uh, quite a bit more. Uh, and the protein level comparison, there's of course these there's you know we're getting most of the things by DIA and pecan that we got with the uh, Comet uh, DDA. Um, but there's, of course, um, there's these, these much, these, these ones out here. Now we, we can't go and make 1100 recombinant proteins. Um, that would take us, uh, quite a bit of time and effort. So we randomly selected, um, 16, uh, GST fusions proteins. We made them and we picked the ones, uh, that had beyond a certain number of peptides within, uh, within a given protein sequence. So we discarded ones that were basically like single peptides for a given protein, and then we, in, in the end, we made 16 proteins. This resulted in about uh, 86 peptides that we had good SRM data for. Um, and these are purified proteins, essentially. Um, and then we took our HeLa Digest, our DIA, and our pecan uh, data, which um, there were about 73 pr uh, proteins that were present of these 80, 86 peptides. And if you make a correlation between the SRM data from the recombinant standards from those in the DIA data, they basically um, follow a very nice trend. So everything kind of agrees, even though they're run on different instruments at very different times. These are basically using a recombinant protein standard to evaluate um, uh, that of, of a, um, the DIA data. Um, so we haven't done this for everything, but, but this is definitely was something that was, uh, was fairly convincing to us, that, that Pecan at least wasn't completely making things up. And, and I, I won't go um, uh, into too much detail, but we also spent a lot of time um, working with um, Bill and Lucas to evaluate whether or not the p-values and q-values that were coming out of Percolator from the pecan data were actually real. Um, and just because someone reports a p-value or q-value doesn't mean that they're actually real q-values. Uh, and uh, but we 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 did do a lot of the basic sanity checks that the that the q-values were actually making sense. And uh, that was another uh, thing that was kind of an, important to us. So a couple other things I'll point out. This is, uh, again, just sort of showing a couple other, uh, if you improve the selectivity, um, but we wanted to keep the same cycle time. So we did a bunch of gas phase fractionation experiments. So here's 20 um, MZ data. There's no multiplexing here. Here's two gas phase fractionation at 10. Here's four. And you notice basically the narrower the windows we get, the more things we, um, we obtain. Um, and this is, uh, you know, it's not that surprising. Um, even with DDA and you got to do gas phase fractionation, you get uh, better results. Um, so in that regard, we, we did do gas phase fractionation with DDA results. And we were also asked by reviewers on, on how this compared with Alexi's data. And, and I'll say it's very complementary to what you get from a DA umpire. You definitely get different results um, between the two. In general, um, we can, between DIA umpire and pecan, you can get almost everything you can by DD, DDA and, and Comet. Um, and there are differences. Um, here's with one gas phase fractionation, so wide windows. Here's with two ga uh, gas phase fractionations and four. And uh, in general, um, when you have wide windows, um, pecan um, uh, gets very similar numbers of, uh, of results as you get with DIA Empire, but there's about 30% of them that are unique to either DIA Empire or to, or to pecan. When the, what, uh, when the isolation windows get smaller, um, the results for both tools get better. Um, but we found that with, uh, that with narrower windows, the results get better faster with pecan than it does with the IA Empire. And uh, we, the only reason why we think this is the case is that we don't require an MS1 uh, feature to actually say that a peptide is detected. So we're not looking at correlation of the products with the MS1 feature. Um, we're, we're basically, we give the percolator both the MS1 information and the MS2 information, but if there's enough evidence on the MS2 information, it will still give us a score that are, that are above a given uh, tolerance. Now, I've had a brief discussion with this over the last couple of days with Alexi, and there is still a caveat here. 
And that is if a PTM falls within that isolation window and most of the product tie-ins are shared, um, it could actually still be a false um, uh, detection. Um, but as the windows get down to about five mass to charge, this becomes a pretty unlikely event. So I'm not saying it's not possible, but it's definitely something that, that, that could derive. So let me talk about a second application. So in our lab, one of the things that we're working pretty uh, hard on with, uh, with the clinical lab, um, with uh, Annie Hoofnagel, um, so Han Yin Yang is working on, um, on coming up with uh, looking for um, a mass spec assay that can, um, that can type amyloidosis um, samples. So the way that this generally works is a pathologist has a Congo red staining, and they cut out regions that are Congo red, and then they, um, and they normally send it to a mass spec lab, and they determine what peptides are, are most abundant. And we're trying to take what's classically done as a DDA experiment and doing a DIA experiment. And in this case, um, we were able to... Um, uh, so one of the common types is transthyretin. And so we were able to show that, that in, within um, this one sample um, that transthyretin was one of the uh, predominant proteins that were in this Congo red stain region. But there's also lots of genotype information. There's lots of mutations that occur that if you have a certain mutations in transthyretin, you have an increased risk factor for, uh, for amyloidosis. So we wanted to not only look at the, the, the reference sequence, but also, you know, some of the, um, the possible alleles. And in this case, we have uh, this, this target peptide sequence, which is, um, which is the, the reference uh, sequence, which has a normal histidine there. And we can find this peptide with, uh, with pecan. Here's the MS1 data. Here's the MS2 data. Uh, here's, in another case, is the second peptide, which where you have the histidine to arginine, um, and it's got a miscleavage. There's almost no MS1 signal that's detected, but we do see plenty of product dyne data at the, in the MS2 data. And then if you actually have the completely cleaved form, uh, you have an MS1 signal and also um, the product dyne data. So what our kind of conclusion of this is, is not only can we say that this patient was had um, had amyloidosis of the transthyretin type, so this, it was typed, the sample was typed as being transthyretin amyloidosis, uh, but we also were able to show that there were heterozygous for this, for this, um, this uh, uh, single nucleotide polymorphism, which was an increased risk factor for, for amyloidosis. So we both gained uh, the phenotype and the genotype in, in the same uh, mass spec run. Here was another experiment that was done um, in collaboration with the company. Um, we were given some uh, neuronal cell lines and we, it, we were blinded to which samples were, were those from fetal cells and those from adult cells. Uh, and uh, one of the things that's different, of course, is there's some alternative splicing uh, differences, and one's a much smaller sequence than the other, and there's this gap right here. Uh, one thing that we found is um, here's a, a peptide that we found that spans this splice junction, and it was completely absent from those from sample one, and it was present in all the cases of sample two. So this was actually something that was, again, kind of reassuring and something that allowed us to be done with, with, with pecan. We can ask very specific uh, questions about the individual data. Do we have evidence for this peptide that spans this splice junction? So I brought up uh, on, uh, on Tuesday that this is the typical DIA library search workflow right now, and Alexi kind of expanded upon this quite uh, significantly yesterday. That is, you take a spectrum library and you have your wide window DIA file, and you, you compute a bunch of match features, um, and then you have some sort of machine learning classifier that tries to weight them um, uh, appropriately. Uh, uh, Brian Searle, who's a graduate student in the lab, uh, when he came in, he, he looked at this and thought that he could do some things uh, immediately that could improve upon it. One of the first things he wanted to do was to be, be able to handle um, the overlapping windows I talked about. Um, he thought that was an innovation that was occurring in the lab and thought that he thought that it was important to be able to handle that in, in, a, in, a, in a software tool directly. He's now actually using this Apex method that I had presented to you. He had a, a previous uh, implementation. Uh, then he also uh, saw, of course, that our lab had a lot of experience with this machine learning tool called Percolator, so he, uh, he tried to integrate that. Um, he incorporated some retention time filtering 
information, which I'll talk about in a bit, and also some automated transition refinement. But ultimately, the goal is, is to spit out a file that can go into, uh, into Skyline that can be used for quantitation. It's, it's not so much important to be able to deal with um, uh, uh, the detection of peptides, but also the quantitation. So just to start, um, in this sample type uh, he had, and the, under these conditions, um, he had uh, DDA data, um, uh, and it was a fairly large mass to charge range. Um, and using Comet, uh, this is a 90-minute gradient, so it's a, it's a two-hour total cycle time. And this is about 30,000 peptides uh, that were found by DDA. Uh, when he used wide 24 mass charge overlapping windows, 12 mass charge uh, effective um, uh, when they're demultiplexed, um, he was getting a little bit less uh, peptide detections by pecan. Uh, pecan definitely struggles a little bit with when you start to ask questions with a very large data set. It struggles a little bit with um, its ability to distinguish between false uh, hits and and correct ones. So we have to set a threshold that's a little bit higher the more queries you 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 apply. Um, and then uh, he took um, a spectrum library um, that was collected from um, from our lab and also the VN lab, um, and he was able to show that he was able to get about 37,000 peptide detections. So this is, at this point in time, it's very similar to the workflow that you would have with open swath um, or Spectronaut or PeakView. Uh, we're using a set of features that are calculated based on the spectrum library, using things like uh, IRT and and also uh, the fragment ion intensities. And, and uh, and et cetera, we're using percolator basically as a machine learning algorithm that's not that different. So again, we're definitely doing better than you would of number of things detected in DDA. So one of the things he noticed right off the bat was, was the use of IRT. Do you, do you know how big that library is? So um, it says it was ser searched to spectral library. How, what, did he, what did he start It was with? only data that was collected with HeLa. So it was either data collected with HeLa from, from our lab or the VN lab so it was a fairly large spectrum library, but it was only cell specific for the actual DDA TI data. Yeah, I mean, so having some information about the yeah, yeah. about the the library. Would yeah, be it was only it was only a library generated on HeLa cells, and we were applying it to HeLa cells. So it wasn't like a pan human library, which took things from lots of different cell types and lots of different tissue types. So Mike, here uh, Pecan identified uh, less uh -huh. than Connet, right? Compared to your first uh, talk, yeah, where you get more. Yeah, in those cases, though, we're asking much smaller questions, right? So the first case, is we we only queried for twelve hundred proteins. Um, in the in the second case, we were only queried for eight thousand proteins. So if you have two different distributions, you're incorrect and you're correct, and they're overlapping a decent amount. The smaller your query space the more power we're going to have. So we definitely find a case where, where, um, where, so if you have a spectrum library and you have more information like retention time and also things like relative intensity of the fragment lines, the scores are set, a little bit better separated from one another. So, uh, so pecan is basically, once you start querying for a very large number of peptides, in this case it's basically 14 million or 15 million peptides, triptych peptides in the human you know, proteome, that becomes a fairly large query space. And now we actually gain this, this sensitivity improvement may be sort of like what Alexi had brought up uh, yesterday, maybe because, because the library has substantially reduced query space because it's only the things that people have found previously in that sample that it actually may be gaining that extra sensitivity because it's actually reducing the query space. Were, were those other yeah. sorry? Were those other runs also narrow window or wide window? Everything's made, wide window. Everything's, everything's this wide is, window. This is this is the data right here. Yeah. No, no, but I mean the one the the prior runs where the prior you, runs were narrow windows. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that would make that's a right. huge difference. That's right. As well. That would. That's right. Yeah, Lexi. We only did the 1,200 mitochondrial proteins. Yes. Yeah. And I think a lot of this comes down to the fact that, that DDA didn't trigger on a, lot of the, on a lot of the mitochondrial proteins. And a lot of the mitochondrial proteins might have been part of chimeric spectra in the isolation windows, but pecan still able to, because it's only looking at the individual fragment ions. And a lot of the things we did pick up that we found that were specific to Pecan, there was very little MS1 signal in them. So 
that was something that we felt like was, was potentially a unique capability, was the ability that we could find things within a fairly narrow MS, MS isolation window that had very little MS1 signal to start. Okay, so um, so here is um, if you look at this is when Brian Stroll began to to look, think about this pretty pretty in detail. One of the first things he did was look at you know here's the library retention time, here's the actual retention time, and these were done. The library was collected between two different labs basically, and it was between lots of different days and different columns. and And here's the actual retention time. Um, he did do there was fractionation that was done to collect this library, and uh, but when you're when you're actually looking at the DIA data, um, your, his ability to predict the retention time was only plus or minus five minutes. And so this, this um, is, is, was still pretty powerful, but he felt like this is something that, he, that could be improved upon and might be something that would be valuable. So one thing that he has been advocating in our lab for a while now, and, so, and other people as well, so Sonia started thinking about this too, and that is can we separate out the step of uh, detection and quantification. And so can we first define these are the peptides that we have evidence for within a given sample type? It can be across many different samples. Um, and then can we go about just going and collecting lots of quantitative data and then trying to map those detections into the onto the wide window data? So let me describe this a little bit. So often in our lab, we 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 uh, we a lot of our experiments contain 40, 50, or 100 samples that will, will come to us. Um, and, uh, and in these cases, we do um, a wide window DIA experiment, overlapping windows. So uh, as Brian calls them, they're like single shot DIA. We collect that data on the 50 or 100 um, samples that someone would give to us. He then takes a little bit off of each sample and generates a pool of, let's say, those 100 samples. And then he injects those that six times on the same column. And because he was doing 24 mass charge wide windows that were overlapping, by doing six injections now, he's basically got um, uh, four mass to charge. Uh, uh, he's got, I think in the end, he had, I think, six mass to charge that were overlapping that gave three mass to charge of selectivity. So we have now three mass to charge uh, narrow window data, which you can apply a tool like Pecan to detect what peptides are present in the sample using narrow isolation windows. And now these are all done on the exact same chromatography column. It's only finding things that are present in these samples. So we're not taking every possible spectrum that we've ever found before. And we're now taking these narrow window data and then mapping it back in the retention time space to a very narrow retention time in the wide window data. So I'll, 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 I'll explain that again um, in a second. But one of the philosophies that he had, and I think we have in general in the lab, is if you can't find a peptide in narrow window DIA data, you're never going to find it in wide window DIA data. So this only burns through six extra injections. And we have QC steps every fifth injection. We run calibration standards. We run all these other standards. He's like, well, what's, you know, what, why not calibrate the retention time too with basically these six extra injections? So this is basically what happens is with those narrow window data on the exact same chromatography column, the exact same set of times when we're collecting the other samples. Now the retention time prediction from the library, we call it a chromatogram library, not a spectrum library. It's collected from DIA data itself. Uh, it has incredibly narrow um, and small residuals. So we can basically predict the retention time to, to about less than 10 seconds. And over a very large number of runs, we still have to do an alignment. Um, but, you know, 33 runs, 67 runs, you know, 93 runs, et cetera, later, later, we still have this very narrow and tight ability to be able to predict the retention time from one sample to another. So this is basically the workflow that we basically have now, is that we have basically a FASTA file or initial library um, or a query set. You have narrow DIA uh, data files. You take Pecan, which then has a lot of high sensitivity to deal with these fairly large multiple testing. We then generate a chromatogram library, which is basically the things that we feel like we can detect in that individual sample. And now we have the wide window DIA file. We have a, we deconvolute the overlapping windows and we basically then use this to calculate um, our score, et cetera. Does this make sense? Now, this is where basically it becomes very powerful. Um, 
So now we're generating basically 60,000 peptides in that same sort of run. Um, and largely this comes down to the fact that we, we are using this narrow window isolation data that gives us a large sensitivity to detect things in those individual samples. And because we're running them on the exact same column at the exact same set of times we're running the other samples, we're able to map them in the retention time space to a very narrow space in time, which then it gives us this improved sensitivity. And just to kind of uh, demonstrate that, that we're not completely making things up, if you take like, a, like our yeast chromatogram library that was run at the same time um, and generated at the same time on the same column, uh, we basically get almost nothing that comes out of it when we take our yeast chromatogram library and query the, the human database and do this even vice versa. So we've done it both ways. So we, at the same time, we did that. We we generated a yeast library. We generated a human library. We had wide window data for, for, um, uh, for, um, for humans and wide window data for yeast. And we applied the different libraries to the, each ones. And either way, we got a lot, a lot more detections in the, in the um, in the chromatogram library data. And we got basically nothing when we used the opposite species library. It's not that surprising. So, um, and he, yeah. Uh, he, yeah, so, let me go where to find it. Yeah, um, I mean, we, in this case, this was, you know, we did three replicates with the wide windows, right? Um, I was giving an analogy that often this, that we often have a very large number of samples, so running six extra runs don't hurt us that much. But in this case, we had three replicates, um, and these are the individual numbers that we found in the individual number of replicates. And so you're saying whether we take the cumulative data from the from all the runs. Um, you know, I, I actually, uh, I'm wondering if it would... Uh, be, it would actually have kind of the opposite effect, kind of like as Isabel was bringing up on Tuesday, or was it Tuesday or Wednesday, where uh, you could potentially gain, the, the, you also could accumulate false discoveries across the multiple different runs too. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we kind of handle things across many different samples as well and try to minimize that for the outliers. But but it could potentially be that you could you could generate new ones, but you're also going to have those one percent false discoveries, which is in this case, of course, it's like you know it's two hundred things in each of those results. So even the one percent false discovery uh, peptides tend to accumulate. So I had seen on a bunch of the posters and heard some questions, and some people would come up and ask me a little bit about phosphorylation. So I'll tell you a little bit about, about this. Um, this is something that's, again, work being done in collaboration with Judith uh, Vienne. I'm running a little bit behind. I'll try to get uh, through this pretty quickly. Uh, but this is a case where we have um, uh, this, uh, this one peptide has two different... Just to say, I think we have a lot of time in the... Okay. Uh, Tutorial section, so okay. I think you, you're okay. For okay, time. you can take a little bit more. Great, <laughs> thanks. So here's this one peptide. There's two. There's two known um, uh, phosphorylation sites. Um, they have exactly the same mass, um, uh, and few fragmentation masses differ. So you basically only have um, a couple of fragment. Uh, this Y6 and, and B5 fragment ions, and the HPLC retention times may differ. They may not. And just to kind of show you how. Um, prolific this is. So this is kind of a blow up of an enriched uh, phosphoproteome sample. And if you blow into this area that looks like there is basically nothing there, there are lots of peaks there. Um, uh, in this case, there's one phosphopeptide. Um, one peak is resolved. Uh, two peaks are not resolved. So there's basically three, uh, looks like, positional isomers. In this case, it looks like there's two positional isomers. They're not entirely resolved. This one is one phosphopeptide with two peaks resolved. So we definitely feel like the positional isomer problem is a major problem. When you actually analyze these data by data-dependent acquisition, you trigger on the first one or the most abundant one, and then dynamic exclude, uh, exclusion excludes it from sampling it again. So one of the things that, that, that collecting data like this has made us think is that it may actually not be possible to do phosphoproteomics by DDA. Um, and uh, you definitely have to think twice about doing even building libraries by DDA because, uh, because of the fact that you can get these different positional isomers and they could be overlapping.
So, so what Brian uh, started doing is, uh, is, is when he found, if you have an, a, an individual fossil peptide he finds, he then iterates across all different um, uh, uh, pot- pot- uh, potential positional isomers. And then he, uh, he extracts those chromatograms. In this case, here's these, these two potential um, positional isomers, and there's two retention times uh, that are showing up. Um, and then uh, he looks at just the, um, the positional specific, location specific fragment ions, so site specific. And you can see that this one looks like it's, it's clearly this site and this one uh, is this site. I'll point out, I'm not sure if people are familiar, but Gavin Reed has talked about um, gas phase rearrangement of the phospho site in the gas phase in the instrument. Um, we think that these, this peak right here is because of this gas phase rearrangement that's occurring, but we're, we haven't confirmed that. Or not, but it's definitely uh, it's the most likely explanation for that. Um, anyway, so we we are able to basically localize them using just the localization specific ions. Here's another case where um, where this is the precursor chromatograms. So this is the MS1 data. Looks like there's just one signal there. Um, you look at the the uh, product ion chromatograms. There, there's clearly kind of a mess of things going on there. If you look at the localization specific ions, it's clear that we're able to just find two different um, uh, positional isomers. Uh, and so, uh, Brian, I won't go into detail of this, but he actually does have uh, a a localization scoring that's not too different from, let's say, like an A score from the from the Gigi lab, but it's uh, DIA specific, um, and so this is something that uh, uh, he, uh, we're particularly excited about because um, not if you have any one of the positional isomers, he can iterate across all of them and see whether or not there are other positional isomers within a given retention time range and calculate a localization score. So this is, I think, something that's going to be of huge interest to not only the ability to do um, fossil proteomics or any modification proteomics, but also uh, things like um, uh, 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 proteogenomics, because if you have a, a polymorphism, you really need to to demonstrate that the evidence for that modification or that mass change is on a given site, as opposed to just, you know, especially with this wide window isolation data. Okay, so um, the last uh, little bit that I'm going to talk about is uh, is is uh, something that Jared Eggert, since we're working on this, is very preliminary. It's something that we're just beginning to, to kind of get going. Uh, and this is... Uh, uh, it's very similar, I think, in the process to the fact that you have these virtual machines that you're using that has all the software coming on pre-installed. And so what we'd like to be able to do is to make it so that there's a cloud uh, platform where people could put tools and given some simple um, kind of parameters, we can generate a web UI, web interface, where people can upload um, files, they can process it, they can generate a, uh, um, an output and spit out in the end a Skyline document um, at the end of the experiment. So this is um, uh, something that that Jarrett's been working on. And so the idea is that you'd have automated high-quality analysis using data, independent acquisition data. And so DIA data analysis is becoming very popular, but there's... You know, people still struggle with with trying to coming up when spinning out an, uh, a result. Um, and there are some some good closed source solutions, but we definitely need to find one that's that's a good open source solution. And the other thing is um, is you know while I'm saying that you know you know there is no automated analysis, we do feel very strongly like what. Brendan has mentioned several times, and I think other people have mentioned, I think Ludovic also mentioned, this idea of, of just trusting a data matrix as something that we feel very strongly that we shouldn't do yet. So we need the ability still to ultimately be able to visualize the results. So let me uh, start with, with a couple of these steps and break this down. So, so one of the major pain points that people uh, struggle with, and that is that a Windows PC is required to analyze most vendor raw files still. So, so some solutions are you run the entire anal- analysis on a Windows PC, or you convert the files on a Windows PC, uh, re- um, and that means you now have multiple different files uh, of the same thing, and then you transfer it to either a Linux uh, platform or other you know, Unix-based platform. Um, and so what we like to be able to do is that someone could upload you know, the raw data file, and you just, we would handle the data conversion for you in, in the background. So the other thing is a problem is that there's um, there's issues with um, when you have uh, 
peptides are detected in multiple different runs. Some, um, a certain portion of them, at least 1% of them, are going to be false detections. And so uh, if you're not careful, like, uh, like Isabel pointed out, that you, you can start to get the point where you accumulate false discoveries. And so what we'd like to do is be able to um, uh, remove um, peptide detections that contradict one another um, and, and replicate. So Here's a case here. So here's a greater than 10,000 peptides per file. So, you know, there's still a, a fairly large number of outliers. So if you take, you know, two different files and align them to one another, there's still a fairly large number of things that don't, you know, that won't agree with one another. So we basically, um, and there's uh, lots of different files, I think, that are, that are aligned to a common reference in this case. So these are, are basically outliers. So Common solutions that people have is they either manually, you know, remove them. They ignore the fact that they exist, and you know, then they have to try to correct for the false discovery rate um, uh, issues. Uh, or there's still, you know, other things that are still being being thought about. But we'd like to basically this pipeline uh, is meant to handle kind of outlier removal compatible with both DIA, SRM, and MS1 feature finding. And the basic idea is to, is to take a given individual peptide. You sort them by the aligned retention time to one another, and if there's a group of them that that you know that are consistently different than the than the main group, and we're just using a hu simple heuristic right now, but basically here are between two any two different runs. Um, there's and then uh, we were are able to remove you know those that that don't agree with um, with the original um, set. So this is again a very simple heuristic that we're using, but it definitely seems to. Uh, enables to minimize this explosion in the FDR between when you add lots of different files. So another pain point that often happens in DIA data is missing data. Um, and so if you have you know, many different peptides and many different runs, in theory you want a complete data matrix, not these empty holes. Or Our, our colleague uh, Jake Jaffe often says, he calls this holy data, and of course you want unholy data, so you want to make sure you have you know, a signal measured in your, in your heat map that's represented for all of your files and all of your, um, your analytes. And so we have this imputation step, and in that case, um, we, we align and propagate peak boundaries, um, and we use a, uh, a statistical approach to impute the boundaries from all the other files to um, to uh, your individual target one, where, and and so then, um, so yeah, so there's so some people have gone through a line and propagate peak boundaries. There's also statistical imputation, so you just treat it as basically as missing data, and you and you try to impute it based on the, all the other data. Or sometimes people just rem, you know return a not you know a NA and filter out the data points with missing detections. So which ends up being a lot across many different files. So in our case, we align and try to propagate the peak boundaries. So this is basically the case where we um, we we find uh, the most similar runs um, that have the most similar uh, things, and we and we then align our our sample which has an unknown or missing uh, point, and we then use the we align the retention times one another, and we use the, we then uh, transfer and impute the boundaries, the integration boundaries from uh, the one run to the other run. Um, so just to kind of show a couple of examples here, uh, it's able to handle like retention time shifts. So this is definitely a peak that the retention time had shifted in this one run, but you can look at the chromatograms. It definitely looks like the most similar ones to the other peaks, um, and yet we're able to still be able to handle that uh, okay. Um, we also can handle missing detection. So here's a case where it was uh, the peptide was detected in these runs, but it was not detected in, or I guess it was detected in these two runs, but not detected in these ones. So you can then... I got a loud enough. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I think that the 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 connection here had had gone dis disconnected. So then the the other So the the uh, then the other aspect is transition selection, and there's lots of different ways that that people have done this before. So in some cases, people have manually curated the the transitions, so this becomes intractable for a very large number of files. There's um, other ways that tools have basically gone and said, look, we're just going to use the X number of most intense peaks from a library spectrum. We found that this doesn't always work because um, uh, because the sometimes the um, 
Um, the, the, the peptides don't really consider what the interference may be in a wider window. And so there's other options for basically automated detection of chemical noise interferences. So we're using an approach that's in an encyclopedia where basically we, uh, we normalize the area under, uh, under the curve for all the different transitions to one another. Um, so they're all basically normalized the same intensity. We calculate the median uh, profile. So that's this dashed line in black here. And then we look for those that, um, that other chromatographic peaks then that correlate with the median. So any outlier like this yellow portion or this red portion are those that, uh, that, um, that, are, are, that don't correlate with the median. And it turns out that outliers don't seem to skew the median that much because, um, uh, um, that's and, and so that's actually kind of a, a powerful aspect to it. And that we just, again, have another heuristic where we basically say those that have a, a high correlation to the median, we end up keeping and those we remove. Uh, Jake Jaffe's lab has also been kind of working on a, a genetic algorithm, um, uh, which has been uh, really cool, which looks at what's the optimal set of, of transitions across many different runs to give you the best quantitative data. And that that's something... Um, that you know, we'd ideally like to be able to include some time in the future because these these transitions uh, are are not necessarily the best that are going to work across many different runs. But so the other the other pain point I think that people have is uh, they it's difficult to visualize and explore the mass spectrometry data. And even though we've kind of incorporated a bunch of uh, different aspects to a pipeline that are outside of Skyline, uh, we, we want to make sure that we can output a Skyline document ultimately in the end. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of um, reasons for this. Um, uh, it's really important for people to be able to explore the data, share results. Uh, people in our lab often say it's sort of like having a PDF of, of a document that works across any platform, can print anywhere. Um, and so basically you have uh, this, it's, it's free, it's open source, you can share a document um, easily. Um, it's familiar, there's thousands of users. So if you go to publish your data, you have a Skyline document, the results. If you need to manually adjust the boundaries, if you have a very unusual result in one case, like, like Brendan's been showing during a bunch of these, uh, uh, during yesterday, he showed lots of different examples where, where you know, it wasn't until you go back and look at the data you realize that there was clearly a major screw up that occurred. So we think that that's still a very important part of this. So, um, so in the end, uh, ultimately, there's a Skyline output. And we want to ultimately get a lot of these more things working in the in the Skyline code too. So then the other thing that we feel like is, a, is an issue is that a lot of pipelines are kind of closed source and we never really exactly know what they're doing. Um, they're kind of a black box, uh, can't modify the algorithms. Um, so the, our goal, of course, like with a lot of things, is to make sure that everything is, is, uh, is open source. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and also people ask us, well, why the cloud? And uh, when you were talking about complex pipelines on server side type tools, uh, there's, there's really no more of this issue. It doesn't run on my cluster or my machine. Um, we also feel like it's important for having provenance and reproducibility. So, uh, so any version of the pipeline can be rerun at any time on the original data or new data using the, uh, using the same compute environment. In theory, it could scale. Um, each, uh, each file is initially run on a separate uh, node on, on, on Amazon EC2 cloud. And we actually have projects already that have thousands of runs in them, so we need to be able to scale across those. And there's also kind of this modular design, and so people in the lab have already started thinking about, well, maybe we can have it for SRM data where Skyline starts and, and generates an output. There's a transition selection or an outlier removal across many runs. We could potentially even do an imputation, and then we generate a renewed Skyline document. So you could take different portions of the, of the pipeline out and but you know, replace it with different tools, and the other key thing is you know all components are versioned and and run in an isolated uh, cloud compute environment, so there's no more of this. You know, it doesn't run on my machine, and just like Brendan um, has also been kind of trying to point out too, is that you know one of the reasons for using like batch files and other things and scripts is that those things basically become your provenance for how you analyze your data, and you can then go back and reanalyze it exactly the same way the next time. We want to be able to ensure that anyone could rerun and reprocess it and generate the exact same data using the exact same pipeline. Um, so in the last um, two minutes, I know I'm kind of, I want to kind of give uh, another pitch for this. And so this is something, a very new thing that we've been thinking about. Uh, this is very, very, very new. Um, 
and that is, uh, is there a place for a unit resolution instrument for DIA analysis? So a DIA got started initially by John Venable on a linear ion trap, um, and it's basically been supplanted by using high resolution accurate mass instruments. Um, so uh, the, the quadruple orbit trap instrument can basically go at about 10 hertz, occasionally it can go at 20 hertz, depending on how you uh, you, what sort of platform you have, et cetera. And, uh, and uh, a quadruple uh, linear ion trap, this is a heavily modified quadruple linear ion trap, sort of in a modified fusion platform. Um, this is not the way the, the commercial instrument is. This is being done in a collaboration with, with Thermo. But uh, we presented this as a poster at ASMS. And so the instrument that's with a lot of optimizations can eventually now go at around about greater than 60 hertz uh, for peptide analysis. So this is about six times uh, faster. So we started to do just some basic uh, theoretical calculations. This was done by Austin Keller. And so one is, if you have 24 mass charge of overlap and 30,000 resolving power on the orbit trap, this is this dashed orange line. This is what we tend to do a lot of DIA experiments with. And then if you look at four mass of charge of overlap, which is one-sixth of that mass, and using unit resolution in a quadruple ion trap, it's basically the solid line. So it's basically giving the same selectivity. And let me just explain this a little bit. This is the number of peptides in a given proteome that have the number of interference-free transitions. So this is truly just theory. It doesn't take into account things like chromatography otherwise, but basically this is just the collisions of that precursor and product ion mass selectivity. So in many ways, I've showed this yesterday as well, the precursor mass is actually more important than the product ion. So if you, yes, if you have poor product ion uh, selectivity, you need to have good precursor selectivity. And if you have, uh, you know, this, this poor uh, 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 precursor selectivity, you definitely need to have high resolving power. So here's an initial experiment. We wanted to do uh, you know, experiments with two mass charge, four mass charge of overlap, and four mass charge precursor windows. We built a non-column library for four injections of one MZ data. This is getting really narrow, pre precursor isolation windows. Uh, we used a pecan-like algorithm that was modified to make uh, into account like X score as well as scoring. We post-processed with percolator. And we use this 1MZ uh, DIA library, which is now four injections, to be able to remap the data back onto this four mass charge overlap data. We also had different abundance experiments. Um, so we had 14N yeast deleted and 15N yeast at, at, at known ratios. So the first thing here was the 2MZ data gives us uh, from a very, pretty narrow mass range. And we're doing this um, um, uh, because of uh, the two mass charts didn't have quite the cycle time. So here we're looking at about 13,900 peptide detections in this narrow mass range. If you look at 12,900 for four mass charge overlap, and then if you just do four mass charge by itself, it's 10,000. So we, we think that we're able to get the overlap to actually work. The overlap's working better than uh, as about as we expected we could do. We weren't sure initially whether or not we could demultiplex the unit resolution data. And just a little bit of show here in the quantitative data. A point that the quantitative data just looks outstanding. Um, a lot of times with the orbit trap data, it starts to, you know, as you get to lower intensities, the ratios get to be a little bit more towards one. Uh, we don't see that as much with the quadruple linear ion trap data. So it definitely seems to give pretty good quantitative response. This is, again, very early on. And, in, and, and a bunch of the peptides we've looked at, we have get um, better lower limit of quant using the uh, quadruple linear ion trap than we actually get with the quadruple orbit trap. This isn't too surprising given the fact that we are using electron multipliers to actually amplify the signal when, when in an orbit trap we're just using image current detection. So a little bit about the future. So I believe DIA with less than or equal to four mass charge of selectivity across the entire mass charge range is coming. Uh, dynamic range and sensitivity that will approximate pre PRM, but is comprehensive. So if we're talking about four mass to charge or two mass to charge precursor selectivity, the difference between DIA and PRM isn't that much. Um, I, I believe we, we have tools that can handle peptide detection without libraries. Uh, I'm not saying you'd want to use those all the time, but they're definitely useful tools for when you're trying to find something about, that you may not have had a spectrum for or you may not have done a database search for previously, although uh, uh, Alexi's MS Fragger may, may make that to the point where, you know, because you can handle open searches much more readily, he may have been able to pick up those, those modified forms that we may not have actually um, uh, looked at initially from a regular database search. So gas phase fractionation um, to build an on-column DIA chromatogram libraries we think is, a, is particularly powerful. 
Um, and we think of, you know, really fast scanning unit resolution mass spectrometers um, can reduce the cost and improve the performance. Um, uh, although this is very, very, very early, there's no commercial option here yet um, at all. But, you know, if you think about something as being, you know, uh, you know, half to a third of the cost of these high resolution and accurate mass instruments, you think about having two to three instruments for the price of one. Um, and again, I, I'd like to acknowledge um, I've done none of this work, um, and so uh, there's a, you know, a, a, a large body of people that, that uh, work really hard uh, all the time. And I'll point out that Jared Egertson uh, came up with a lot of the multiplexing strategies within the lab. Um, uh, Austin Keller has been uh, doing a lot of the initial implementation and taking over a lot of that um, uh, work from, from Jared. Uh, he's also been working closely with Thermo Fisher and Phil uh, Remish about looking at low-resolution data. Uh, Rich Johnson and Jennifer Merrihew um, deal a lot with our wet lab um, work, and Brendan McLean, uh, as you can see from uh, from this course, has, has taken a major role in in kind of training people to use um, uh, quantitative proteomics, the software tools that came from our lab, and and also uh, he's the a, a main person who's kind of uh, the reason why. Uh, uh, Skyline is what it is and, and is, uh, is so well supported and uh, people see the number of support board requests that get posted and how detailed and thorough they get responded to. Um, uh, Lindsay uh, Pino is a, a joint graduate student with Bill Noble who's been working on a lot of our sort of validation steps for quantitative proteomics and GIA data. Brian Strolls came up with Encyclopedia um, and uh, uh, there's uh, Sonia Ting came up with pecan um, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. I have a start a question. Uh, so you mentioned uh, image uh, or, uh, ion current versus electron multiplier multiple times in your talk and the, and the, and the relative sensitivity. And I was just discussing this yesterday with Olga Vitek and Tina Ludwig. So they, it kind of went by fast. I'm not. Maybe everybody here is a mass spec expert and 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 understands this. But it would be useful for yeah. me to have a summary of yeah. what are the various kinds of detectors used. And you've given us ion trap is obviously electron multiplier, and orbit trap is is yeah. ion current. It's image current, not image ion current. current. Okay, there you go. <laughs> current. Uh, and then, so what is what is getting being used in a triple quadrupole versus uh -huh. a TOF instrument, yeah. which is the two others? Yeah. So, um, so, so Fourier transform instruments are fairly unique in the fact that they're non-destructive. So you can measure the ions for a very long period of time in the in the ion trap without destroying them. And so, uh, but and as the uh, the ions go past. Um, uh, a plate, they generate a current. But generally, for every ion and every time it passes it, you have one ion, one electron. Um, the only thing that really saves you is that you have lots of ions and you measure it lots of times. So that that's gives you basically, you have this image current and that generates the, the transient that gets measured that then gets Fourier transferred, transformed into our spectrum. So, so that's basically how an Orbi trap works uh, in a very simplistic way. As far as an, uh, uh, an ion trap mass spectrum or, or linear ion trap, we basically... Um, we, we apply a frequency ramp and we and ions become unstable from, from the ion trap and they get ejected from the ion trap and we then detect them uh, at, at an electron multiplier. An electron multiplier is fairly unique in the fact that for every one ion you get 10 to the fifth electrons because uh, you're amplifying your signal. Um, so it's, uh, we don't have the equivalent of PCR but we actually do have electron multipliers so we can, we can uh, we can magnify. It's kind of like having an amplifier on your stereo, right? You can you can amplify the the signal without amplifying the noise too much. And there's a lot of effort that's gone into making these low noise um, ion detection systems. Uh, quadrupoles, uh, so triple quadrupoles tend to use electron multipliers as well. Um, and uh, and uh, and you know a lot of time of flights they tend to use either uh, multi-channel plate detectors or electron multiplier detection uh, systems. Um, the key thing there that's different is that it's a um, often a time to, uh, measurement as opposed to just uh, associated with uh, either a scanning a quad or scanning a trap. So, so that tends to be a little bit of a constraint, of course, on how the detector works. It has to be something that can operate under a fast time constraint. So hope that answers your question. Other questions?
Maybe I can ask about, so the pecan percolator uh, combination, you said you did some work to uh, look at the p-value and q-values to make sure that these are were, were legit. Can you say what this uh, yeah. entailed? Or? So, yeah, of course. Um, so one of the first things that Bill often asks us to do um, with this is, is to take a, a, a set of peptides that are not present in the sample, and in there you should get uh, your p-values and q-values that come back should be uniformly distributed. Um, and so, uh, and then if you make things like a, like a QQ plot, you should get basically a straight line versus the rank P value or Q value or the observed P value and Q value. So that's basically a sanity check. There's still other ways in which that can fail, but that's, a, that's the initial thing that we definitely did. Um, so we, we felt like if you, if you query null data, you should get basically uni uniformly distributed P values and Q values. If you have, um, uh, features that tend to learn the difference between targets and decoys, um, then those tend to fail. So some of those, those plots and features don't tend But in general, they work very, they, they tend to work. And the, the uh, retention time filtering that you showed towards the end there, kicking out retention time outliers, is that happening before the FDR, the Q-value calculation or, or after? Is this kind of? Uh, it's, it's after. So we have not done uh, what Isabel talked about as being whole experiment-wide uh, Q-value and P-value calculations. We've right. done per run P-value and Q-value calculations. I'm just wondering that. I mean, you could imagine, so there's already some score that says, uh, uh, in most of the algorithms, that says what's the delta retention time, yeah. the delta from the predicted retention time. But you could imagine having a hard threshold as part of the, the, dis yeah. the discriminant score. And uh, as long as it's symmetric to the target and decoys, it, it should still be OK well, to I do this, I think this right? is a little different. So, um, so this is basically saying, let's say you have a random false hit. Because at a 1% false discovery rate, there will still be hundreds of peptides from any one run that are just going to be false. And then let's say 50 of those 100 false ones happen to be shared with a, one of another of 100 files. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we're basically saying, look, if it's truly a random match, then the retention times won't align up right. well. And so we're basically saying we should just throw, discard them. Mm -hmm. um, that's basically what, okay. uh, yeah. what. And if we get them to agree between a large number of samples, then what we'll do is we'll impute them across the ones that we're missing. Mm -hmm. I, I should have explained that probably a little bit better, but uh -huh. yeah. Okay, anything further from Mike, or otherwise we'll go to coffee and let's would come. have one question. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, there, yeah. <laughs> you should some examples where there was clearly no MS1 uh, mass traces visible, but you got very, very clean MS2 traces. Yeah. Um, could you speculate yeah. how this happens? Yep. Is this something specific to Orbitraps, or would you see the same on a TOF? or on any other mass detector? Uh, so I would say that this is worse on an Orbi trap than on a TOF. Uh, so on an, in an Orbi trap, you're limited by the number of ions you can put into the trap before you have space charge effects. So in many cases, it's, you know, arbitrarily, it's about a, a million ions. You know, sometimes you can go up to two million, sometimes it's only 100,000, but in general, it's about a million ions. So if you're filling from 400 uh, um, uh, let's say from 400 to 1,000. That's, uh, that's 600 mass to charge. And so uh, that's basically, your, let's say there's a million molecular species, or let's say there's 1,000 molecular species in that scan. The dynamic range is going to be very limited for the, more, the lower abundant ones. Now, when you fill with a 20 mass to charge range, you're putting a million ions in the 20 mass to charge range. So that's basically a 30x enrichment in your signal. And that, but that comes at the expense of time. So you have to then fill for a lot longer to get that million ions, but, and then we stop at a maximum inject time. So, so we say, look, we're not gonna go over a certain period of time. We're only gonna enrich for a certain period of time. So that means that we, we can, in theory, if we fill the Orbi trap in the MS1 scan and in the MS2 scan, in, that, in essence, if you're going from a 600 mass charge range down to a 20 mass charge, that's about a 30X enrichment. So that's not surprising that we gain and see lots of things in the MS2 space that we don't see in the MS1, just because the dynamic range is improved. Now, some of the issues come the fact that the MS1 just isn't selective enough. It could be stuff like the phosphopeptide examples I gave you, where the MS1 signals are basically the same mass are there. They're essentially the same retention time, and we can't distinguish between them. But we can, on the product ions, distinguish. There are some product ions that distinguish between the location of the phosphorylation sites. Um, so I think, I think those are the main reasons. So one is that the MS, 
two is going to be more selective because the likelihood of having things at the same precursor mass and fragment ion mass at the same time is less likely than just the same precursor mass at the same time. And then the, the and that happens, that's issue that's based on any tandem mass spectrometry. The MS2 tends to be more sensitive in that case than the MS1. Uh, then there's on ion traps in particular that we're limited by this trap capacity, but that we also have this advantage of automatic gain control that we can enrich for things when we fill with a narrow mass. Now you can do MS1 in a narrow range too, which they, what Thermo calls SIM scans, which basically means you have a quad that basically fills for an, only a narrow range. And in that case, it will probably be more sensitive than the MS2 as long as there's no interference. If you have more interference, then the MS2 is always going to be better than, than the MS1. I can say on QTOF that we, we see this problem too sometimes. So uh, specifically on, on the SIX QTOFs, um, there's a mechanism to attenuate the uh, MS1, the, 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 the ion current in, in MS1 in order to basically protect the detector and because you can't uh, digitize the signal fast enough. And so there's, there's this setting parameter called ITC, which is basically uh, gating ions uh, somewhere in the front optics to to uh, essentially protect the detector. So if there's if there's a lot of material coming out of the column at one particular time, you know it can be as little as like five percent of the ions that are actually uh, uh, that are actually passing passing this gate. And what they do is multiply the signal back by the by the amount that they that that they gated it. So we can see, especially in more complex samples, a, a clear a very clear difference between uh, MS1 and MS M, MS2 signals as well on at least on the psi sci QTOFs if you do dilution curves or something like this. So it's it's not only your problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But th that's a great question, though. That's a really good question.